Well, good evening and welcome to the New York Society Library. I'm Mark Bartlett, the head librarian, and it's great to see a full house here this evening. This is our second month of events this fall season, and if you are a guest with us tonight, though, though I believe most of you are members, we're glad to have you here as guests. We have membership brochures and events calendars down in the lobby, if you would like to pick one up on your way out. Before my trustee, Jeanette Watson Sanger, introduces our speaker tonight, may I ask you to take out your cell phones if you have one and please turn it off, put it on something that will not make any sound this evening and uh, we'll uh, enjoy the evening better. This is the time of year that we ask our members to support our annual fund. The money that we raise is critical to supporting events like the one this evening, our collection, our great children's library, reader services, and the rest of our operating budget. Thank you for giving as generously as possible. We do have copies of Ms. Caro's book, Paris to the Past, for sale outside, and you can uh, pick one up after the event, and I believe she'll be happy to sign your copy as well. And now let me introduce Jeanette, who will introduce our speaker. Good evening and welcome. Tonight we are so lucky. Even though we are not on a plane to Paris, we have the next best thing. We have Ina Kara speaking to us about Paris. Rarely have I seen a book with such great reviews. Now, I loved the book and raved about it, but I have some quotes from some authors who are far more eloquent than I am. And one of them is Doris Kearns Goodwin. She said, it is hard to imagine a more enchanting or more brilliantly conceived book. With Ina Caro as your guide, you will fall in love with French history. Ancient castles and cathedrals come to life through her marvelous stories, biographical gems capture the lives of memorable kings and queens. But most of all, you will fall in love with Ina Carroll herself, with her infectious love of history, food, and architecture, her husband, and life itself. And now one more from a great writer, Brenda Wineapple, who says, with charming humor and easy erudition, Ina Caro's Paris to the Past is an exuberant journey from the city of light to the outlying monuments of its storied, glorious, peculiar, and even culinary past. Ushered from Romanesque church to Gothic cathedral, from gilded bronze doors to walled cities, from Joan of Arc to Marie de Rohan de Rochefoucauld, we travel with our companionable piquant narrator, into the vagaries and unexpected corners of time and place. This is a gem of a book. And I have been a big fan of Ines for a long time, and with her previous book, my husband and I have taken some wonderful journeys, including to Conk, one of the most beautiful medieval towns I've ever seen, and Malmaison. So I highly recommend the first book as well. And I'm so looking forward to taking one of Ina's trips from this, this book. And I think I will start at the 12th century with Saint-Denis and work my way through French history. Ina Caro is the author of the best-selling The Road from the Past, Traveling Through History in France. She received her master's degree in history with a concentration on medieval history after study at Columbia and Long Island University. She holds an honorary degree from the SUNY Graduate Center. She is the sole researcher for the award-winning biographies of Robert Moses and Lyndon Johnson by Robert Caro, to whom she is married. Bob has told me what a brilliant researcher Ina is and that she is the only researcher that he can trust. Bob and, <laughs> Bob and Ina have had an apartment in Paris for many years and have traveled extensively through France by train and car. Ina always timing everything so she can let us know exactly how long it takes from door to door. Ina's love of France and extensive knowledge of French history and culture imbues every page of her book. And now let us welcome Ina Carroll. Hi, thank you, Jeanette. That was such a lovely introduction. 
Uh, I'm here tonight to talk to you about a new way of traveling through France. Paris to the Past describes how to stay in Paris and take a day trip to a different century each day and come back to Paris each night. You can stay in Paris and never have to pack or unpack and visit places as far away as 13th century Angers, over 300 kilometers away, and be back in Paris that same night. In other words, you can travel through 800 years of French history by taking 25 train trips from Paris. As you take the train from Paris, you will travel century by century, chronologically through time, and be back in Paris each night for dinner. What I have tried to do in Paris to the Past is illuminate the intersection of travel and history, how travel makes history more interesting and history makes travel more interesting. Let me, let me tell you uh, how I got the idea for Paris to the Past. My husband, Bob, and I had always wanted to go to France, it seems. We had taken a car trip across America on our honeymoon and wanted to do the same thing in France. But for m many years after we were married, we were broke, totally broke. Bob had quit his job on Newsday to write a book uh, he had gotten a small advance, which we jokingly called the world's smallest advance. Small as, as it was, he thought he would be finished with the book in nine months and we would still have enough money to go to France. The book was called The Power Broker, Robert Moses and the Fall of New York, and it didn't take nine months to write, but it actually took him seven years, and we were broke for most of those seven years. But when he finished the power broker, the New Yorker bought it, and the, with the check, the first thing we did was go to France. We cashed the New Yorker check the moment it was in our hands and left for France the next day. We didn't even stop to make a reservation. I remember Bob asking the stewardess on the, uh, on the plane what hotel to stay at. And we stayed at a little hotel in Paris called Les Tuileries on the right bank. We stayed in Paris for a week, and then we rented a car and just began driving around the French countryside. We just loved driving around the countryside. Although I thought the main focus of our trips was going to be the restaurants, it turned out they were not. Although I've never liked any place where the uh, didn't have a good restaurant. But what I found so very fascinating were the towns and villages of France that seemed unchanged from the Middle Ages or the Renaissance, and some seemed unchanged even from the time that France was part of the Roman Empire. As we returned to France each year, we would travel around a different section of the country. We found each section seemed to have its own history. One year we drove around the Dordogne Valley, as we visited the 14th century castles built by the English on one side of the river and the French castles on the other, the Hundred Years' War came alive. The next year we explored Languedoc in the south with its walled medieval cities and its Romanesque churches, and the Middle Ages came alive. On each trip, I felt as I was escaping from the present into the past, and into ages I had loved reading about, and history seemed to come alive. But as wonderful as our first trips were, there was something that was not quite right. As we were visiting historic sites built over 2,000 years, we were hearing so many dates, so many names of kings, so many Louis. It was Louis the Pious, Louis, Louis the, uh, the Fat, St. Louis, 18 Louis who were kings, and a lot more that weren't. So when we returned to New York, the trip was somewhat of a blur. Then one year, we visited the Loire Valley, sometimes called the Valley of the Kings, because so many kings had built their castles there. It was while we were there that I, found, I discovered a way of traveling so that our trips would not be a jumble of dates and architectural styles. The solution was actually quite simple. 
I just arranged our trips chronologically. In other words, we were staying at a centrally located hotel. I simply mapped out our visit to the castles in the order they were built. For example, we were in the Loire Valley, and so we visited the 13th century castle of Chignon first. Chignon is a massive defensive fortress, a man-made uh, cliff of walls and martial keeps rising out of a natural escarpment. We then traveled through the many years of the Middle Ages, visiting the walled city of Loche, then the medieval castle at Amboise, the Renaissance chateau at Blois, and finally, Francis I's castle at Chambord. Arranging our trips to sites in the order they were built, in chronological order, wasn't difficult at all. And, but it changed our experience totally. In fact, you can't imagine what a difference it makes. You actually see architecture evolve. You can see, uh, as you travel from one place to another, you can watch as huge military towers of, of an early fortress become fanciful turrets as free, feudal France insecure in the Middle Ages, becomes the France of the Renaissance and then a nation state. You see the no man's land surrounding fortresses, that empty expanse of, of ground that invaders had to cross, uh, exposed to a defender's arrows, evolve into gardens. You see arrow slit windows open up into huge pane windows so that gardens that were once no man's land could be seen as floral tapestries from inside. And you see moats become reflecting pools. As we traveled from Chignon to Loche to Amboise to Chenonceau, you could feel France becoming more and more secure. As we traveled through the centuries, architecture was gradually replaced by opulence and luxury as France evolved from a decentralized feudal state into a wealthy nation. For many years, every time Bob would finish a section of his book, we would take off for France, stay briefly in Paris, and then travel around a different section of the country, Provence one year, the Loire Valley another, Normandy another. Then a problem arose, a lovely problem, but a problem nonetheless. Someone gave us an apartment in Paris. It was overlooking the Seine and Notre Dame, and we didn't want to leave. Not ever. I loved walking along the Seine at night. I loved going to the festivals of old movies. I found that the Parisians loved old movies as much as I did. And I love going to the opera at the Ornate Opera Garnier, or listening to concerts in ancient churches, or just a musician playing a violin on the Pont Neuf with his violin case open for euros, <clears throat> or just walking, just walking along the streets of Paris. But there was a problem. While I loved Paris, there were so many places outside Paris that I still wanted to visit. Then one day, I was on the metro. We were going to the races. At least I thought we were going to the races at Vincennes. Just that week, just the week before, Bob and I had gone to the races at Longchamp and had had such a good time that when we saw that the races were at Vincennes, we decided to go. The, they were at the Hippodrome at Vincennes. So we went but we got off the metro at the Chateau Vincennes stop. The word chateau should have given me pause, but it didn't. We, when we got off at the Vincennes stop, the first thing I saw was an immense wall of what looked suspiciously like an enceinte, the outer wall of a castle. Still not realizing my mistake and expecting to see a racetrack on the other side of the wall, we saw instead, to my absolute astonishment, a perfect 14th century uh, fortress complete with a moat, a drawbridge, arrow slit windows, and machicolations. Machicolations are those architectural details that make uh, fortresses look so romantic, but are actually holes through which boiling water was poured on anyone trying to scale the walls. 
After getting over my disappointment at not finding a racetrack in Vincennes, which, is, which happened to be on the other side of the Bois de Vincennes, I slowly became excited as it dawned on me that I, what had happened. I had taken a 13-minute metro ride from central Paris to the 14th century. When we got back on the metro and I looked up at the station stops that are listed above the window, I realized that 14th century was not the only century that I could visit by metro. In fact, I could take the metro to many ages of French history. There was a stop at the 12th century, at 12th century Basilica of Saint-Denis, the first Gothic cathedral ever built, where stained glass was used in windows for the very first time. Another stop at the 13th century, at Saint-Chapelle, where the art of stained glass reached its height. At 17th century, at the Place de Vosges, and at the 18th century, at the Place Royale, where so many of the plots of the French Revolution were hatched. By the time my metro ride had ended, I realized I could visit quite a bit of French history by just taking the metro. I also realized I could take the RER, the suburban train, to many other places. It's almost as easy to use as the metro. And the RER could take me to Louis XIV's Versailles or Fouquet's Vol de Camp and Napoleon's Malmaison and Compiègne. But it was not only the metro and the RER I could take from Paris, but I could take the train. I could go to places like Chartres that were less than an hour away. And because of the new train in France, the TGV, I could visit the 13th century at Angers or the rebirth of cities in the uh, 16th century at Tours, over 100 miles away, but just an hour. I could reach it now in just an hour, even though it was 100 miles away. And taking the train in France is so simple and, in, and inexpensive, especially if you happen to be smart enough to purchase a rail pass before you leave the United States. What I realized was I could stay in Paris and visit France's past by taking a day trip by train. And taking the train rather than car had the advantage of dropping you off in the heart of ancient cities, avoiding the modern suburbs which have become formidable mazes which surround most of the cities today, like in the United States. For example, Angers is a city in the Loire Valley which we had always felt was too far to reach by car. The three-hour train trip from Paris was also too long. But now there was a TGV, and by TGV, you can get to Angers in half that time. And you get off the train, you walk a block, and there you are facing this dinosaur of a castle. There's nothing that looks like it in the United States, nothing at all. There are 17 huge towers, each large enough each of the towers are 164 feet tall, and each are large enough to hold an entire garrison of men, their supplies, for an entire siege. For me, the castle became even more interesting when I learned why it was built and who built it. It was built by a woman, Blanche of Castile, whose husband, the king, had died after a reign of only three years. The widowed queen had been left with an 11-year-old son who hadn't been crowned yet, and the feudal lords of France saw their chance to take the power back from the monarchy, which had increasingly centralized power in their hands. Blanche built this castle to show them that they could not, that they had better not mess with her. Paris to the past takes you on a journey through 800 years of French history by visiting castles and villages that evoke the events of the past. And at each of the places I visited, I have provided a guide from the past, a guide like Suget, who built the basilica at Saint-Denis to take us through the basilica that he built, or Blanche of Castile to take us around the fortress of Angers, or Joan of Arc, to lead us around Orléans, and Francis I to guide us through Fontainebleau, or Fouquet, Louis XIV's financial minister who built 
and guides us through his fab- fabulous chateau at Volavacamp, and Napoleon to guide us through Malmaison and Compiègne. With Paris to the past, you can stay in Paris. Paris to the past takes you on a journey through the eight, 800 years of French history by visiting castles and villages that evoke the events of the past. And uh, with Paris to the past, you can stay in Paris and never have to pack or unpack, and yet still visit some of the most exciting places in the French countryside. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Do you ever yeah. get tempted to eat the food on the train? <laughs> of course, I eat everywhere. <laughs> yes? What is your favorite restaurant in Paris? <laughs> well, favorite is uh, a restaurant that's near the apartment in which we're living, so we can walk to it uh, easily each night. Is it? Yes? What would be a good time of the year to do this? Well, um, I don't suggest August. <laughs> but I would say the spring and the fall are marvelous, and uh, I wouldn't go when it's too cold. Your description of Beau Le gives a wonderful picture of the politicking. <laughs> I, th- I don't think there's one in the United States, but uh, I'll lend you one that I have that I bought in France. <laughs> yes? I was just thinking about uh, how the United States sadly doesn't have a fine train system like this, and I wonder if you have any insights about why that is. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I wish that we had a train system like they had in, in France. I mean, with the spaces that you have to cover in this country, you would think that you'd have the most marvelous train system, but this country seems to be so wedded to the car. And the, uh, one of the things that they did in France that I don't think we have the guts to do in this country is raise the gas prices to a uh, level where people just can't afford to use the car to the same extent that we do here. Yes? That's that's very true, and it is it is wonderful the way that you can rent a car at the train station and most of the uh, French train stations. But the glory of taking the train and not being hampered by a car—I mean, just getting on a train, going someplace, and then walking around this marvelous town or place—I mean, that, and then getting back on the train and coming back to your apartment or to hotel in in Paris. Uh, is uh, was a fabulous experience for us. So is that, I, I'm only uh, in the first chapter. <laughs> so, I, uh, so I know what I said in the end. It's going to be subjective. Uh, but in the rest of the book, when you take the TJB um, or the Metro, are you then walking from the station to where you're going? Oh, absolutely. Oh, fabulous. I mean, it drops you right off in the center of, the, of town. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear. 
Well, uh, last year we did go to Rome, and I was thinking about it. I had a wonderful time in Rome, um, so I'm thinking about it. Well, walking. <laughs> I was thinking of something where I could... Now, I mean, I've written a book about um, taking a train, I've taken, taking a car. Now I wanted to find some place where you can just walk. <laughs> Unfortunately not. I wish I had. I, yes. Sure. I haven't been to Marseille. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but I know what you're you're referring to. Yes. I know you're a historian and uh, the history of France uh, interests you a great deal. You've been going there for many years and I wonder if in your time capsule if you would between when you first went and uh, you've found anything in, in your talking to people or being around that indicates a progression in the country, good or bad, politically or uh, interestingly, architecturally or whatever? Well, the uh, French are increasingly making uh, the different sites of, uh, I mean, they treat it as tourists, I mean, as a money-making thing. I mean, they want, uh, they really restore things beautifully because they realize it attracts tourists. Uh, the, on the negative side, the only negative thing that I found is that uh, the restaurants in Paris don't seem, I don't know if it's me that's changing or them, but they don't seem as wonderful as they once did. That's what I was hoping people would do, so that um, as you travel, you go to the Middle Ages, then you go to the later Middle Ages, then the Renaissance, and I mean, uh, so that you can see France evolve. Uh, that's the reason that the book is arranged the way it is. Yes. What is your favorite region? The favorite museum. Favorite, favorite region. Favorite region. Yeah. I don't know, it would be hard between Normandy and the Dordogne Valley. I mean, it would be very difficult to choose. Has the book come out in French, Will, and how did the French react? Uh, the, the book is in France, but it's in English. And the first book stayed in English and was never translated. I think the French are that way. <laughs> Thank you.